Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 28th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. This is the Somerville School Committee and Superintendent's Update. I am so pleased to be joined once again by Chairwoman of the Somerville School Committee, Carrie Normand. And our special guest today is Nomi Davidson of the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative. Good afternoon to both of you. Good afternoon, Joe. Good to see you. Good to see you. Rainy days and Wednesdays, huh? So um, <laughs> October is almost gone, my friends. Um, we have uh, given our updates consistently, trying to keep the Somerville public, the students, the teachers, the caregivers, everyone updated on what's happening with the Somerville school system. Carrie, I want to lead off. I know that you have, you and the mayor and the superintendent have an important meeting coming up. I think it's the 29th. Is that tomorrow night? That is tomorrow night and it is the 29th. You you passed that pop quiz on what day we were on. Nicely done. <laughs> and it is a town hall concerning potential plans for the reopening of the system in a hybrid way. Is that correct? That is correct. That and, the, and, and so much more. Um, would you like me to speak to sure. it or do you okay so yes uh there are uh, so many moving parts here so this will be the second town hall just on the schools and it's about the buildings it's about the testing protocol it's about thresholds it's it's a lot and so it will be tomorrow night thursday the 29th at six o'clock you can join us remotely go to the city website click on the covid bar on the top the link will be there. We will have uh, Haitian Creole, Spanish and Portuguese interpretation available again. This is important that all of our families have uh, information. So uh, we are still working, we, the, the buildings, the testing, that, that's on the city side, but I do speak of us collectively. There are things that, um, that need to come together on the city side for then the school to, to be able to reopen. We, are, on the school side, uh, the remote has been going great. Uh, I mean, great, nothing about the situation is great. It, it is much better than the spring, but there are questions about the testing and reopening buildings and flexibility. So the, on the school side, even though we don't have hard dates yet, um, we're getting closer. We have everything in place, or we're working towards that to be able to bring the kids back in a phased in manner. And Carrie, this goes right along with the conversation that we've been having for a couple of months now, that at some point, the city and the superintendent's office and the school committee and the unions and everybody will have kind of a template about how we're gonna move forward. But so much of that is being data driven by the pandemic numbers themselves. So I think, you know, even though we're gonna have this um, town hall tomorrow night, um, I would just give a word of caution um, that everyone needs to be flexible, that should those numbers um, uh, climb in a significant way, all plans could be put on the back burner. So I, I, I think I speak for a lot of people in my own family who have young children in grade school that they, the kids are anxious to go back. They're not exactly thrilled <laughs> with remote learning, um, but phasing them back in gives a lot of kids a glimmer of hope that they will be able to go back someday. Um, you know, our updates have kind of targeted in around that uh, second week of November to try to give people more of a sense of what the date will be and then maybe announce it sometime around Thanksgiving. So not too far off. We're not right. too far off by what we've been saying for the past couple of months. And, and the mayor has said, you know, that, that December 1st is the target date, the hopeful date of, of opening the buildings, but you, the word you use flexibility cannot be overemphasized, right? It is, uh, as we get buildings uh, come back online, and and we can open them in a safe way. We are all going to need to be very flexible in our thinking of, uh, you know, we have, we have our priority prioritized 
um, students, right? Our younger ones, our special education students, our high needs, our, our English language learners, um, also our CTE seniors who need to get back in the shops to be able to graduate. And so it's not gonna be like a switch is flipped and all the buildings are open. We are going to, as a community, need to be very flexible in our thinking. And uh, the, the East may be your home school and it may not be where you go back, at least in this interim phase. Right. Uh, we can say it's flexibility and everything about this year is, um, uh, is determined by so many other factors. It's not, including the virus. As with anything else, Carrie, I think a lot of decisions are gonna be made based on science, health, and safety. So it's a pretty good segue into bringing Nomi into the conversation. Nomi, you and your crew have been um, active within the city since 2011 at the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative. And I would venture to say it's an understatement to say that the services and the, the need of your organization have never been higher than during the COVID pandemic. You wanna take it away and give a little bit to the audience about what it is the collaborative does? Sure, sure, thank you so much. Um, actually, when you said the word flexibility, that is the essence of the SFLC. We always need to be flexible and adapt to the changing needs of families in the community. Uh, the SFLC, its roots were from the 90s um, and that there were components of family engagement in the district. Um, there was the Parent Information Center, which did enrollment and had kind of the first cohesive uh, multilingual staff in the community. Um, we also had a whole series of early childhood family engagement programs that were all grant funded, home visiting, play groups, parent support groups. Um, in 2011, as research kind of grew around how critical family engagement is to impacting student achievement, uh, the superintendent at that point um, funded part-time positions in the public schools for family liaisons, kind of bridges to the families um, within the schools. And we created this, this Somerville Family Learning Collaborative, which was uh, has, has been a bit of an anomaly because we're kind of cross-sector, not a nonprofit within, you know, a, a district, a public school department. And that's also been our strength because it's a tremendous amount of collaboration with community-based programs and the city. And so in 2011, we named ourselves the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative. And um, in the last few years, we've grown um, dramatically and that's, you know, we are so grateful to the superintendent, the school committee, and um, we did a strategic plan a few years ago. This is just to give you historical context on the services we provide. And we have four teams within the SFLC. Um, early childhood, which is the summer baby program in collaboration with the city that services to any newborn born in the city. Um, a home visiting program that's particularly around literacy for high needs families, play groups, parent support groups, the parent information center, which is now the enrollment and registration center, school based liaisons in the school, which miraculously uh, in this crisis were funded to all be full time in all the schools. So we have a multilingual team of uh, liaisons in the schools. We have parent leaders that have kind of emerged out of our parent English classes who do outreach. And then finally, our family, um, our basic needs and partnership um, team, which is homeless services, uh, multilingual services, and volunteer services. So that's kind of the ecosystem of the SFLC. So Nomi, if I can, uh, uh, it's a lot, but I, a, a lot of times I need to filter it down to things on how I can understand it. Sure. The, the FSLC, almost as if you act as a hub for a lot of these services and they are the spokes in the wheel. So when families of school kids have issues with kids learning, 
you kind of the central point and say, okay, let me, let me get this in touch. Let me get you in touch with this person. If families or students or, or experiencing food insecurity or housing insecurity or medical cost insecurity. As we all know, if kids go to school hungry, they don't learn as well. If kids have issues at home with parental domestic problems, they don't learn as well. If they're worried about where they're gonna be living a month from now because dad lost his job or mom lost her job, they don't learn as well. So the service that you provide is to make sure that people understand no matter what socioeconomic um, sphere they come from, you can provide a service or get them into the right service. And I think the major point um, that I'm taking away from it is it often becomes very frustrating for someone experiencing problems, not just in the school age kids, but anywhere that you're bounced from department to department, from resource to resource to resource. Right. So have I encapsulated what SFLC is formed to be? It, it's like you've known about us for years. <laughs> um, beautifully articulated, we're the connectors and we also provide direct services. So let, let's get into some of the nitty gritty during COVID. Where are you seeing the most need for services at this point? Um, I think it is housing insecurity, technology support when we were initially um, distributing the Chromebooks and just access, hotspots, uh, learning how to turn on the com computer, food insecurity, um, diapers. We initiated a whole diaper distribution program with the beautiful stuff project and cradles to crayons. So that's an example of real cross-sector work because we can't do it alone. Um, cash, just, you know, people who have nothing left because they've lost their jobs and then their housing is threatened. Um, health insurance, um, I think those are actually, I wrote them down before so I wouldn't forget because they just, uh, finding out about testing um, and just worries about their health, um, unemployment assistance. A lot of the initial months were helping people fill out applications and that was a learning curve for us. And I just wanna, many of our multilingual staff be, developed relationships with families because they were their safe place and would get calls at all times of day or night and continue to be that safe place for families. And um, Romy, that's a critical piece of it to have multilingual staff because I think it escapes a lot of people like me, white privileged people, that we have kids in our school system who are fluent in English but they may be going home to a house where neither parent speaks English as a first language. So that creates an issue when the parent goes to fill out unemployment forms or medical assistance forms. Absolutely. And one of the extraordinary structures that emer emerged through this emergency is the Immigrant Services Unit, which is a group from the city, the schools and nonprofits and we all work together so that there is tremendous, you know, cross communication. There are updates every day about the eviction moratorium, what housing resources there are, what, what the changes have been in food distribution. So we're all, I mean, this is probably one of the only silver linings that everybody is working so closely and in close communication. Um, I want to throw this out to both of you, you and, and Carrie, um, the, the, and it's um, serendipity that we're talking about the housing crisis that we may have, I don't say may, that we will inevitably have. Um, so for those following along, the governor refused to extend the housing moratorium, the eviction moratorium past October 17th. Um, tomorrow, we have almost a full show with Senator Pat Jalen, uh, Ellen Schachter from the Office of Housing Stability, yeah. 
Um, and we're gonna be talking about what resources the city of Somerville will be offering and the larger effort of trying to get the governor to understand the magnitude and my words, the cruelty of putting people out of their homes during a pandemic at the beginning of winter. I, I'm not sure why certain people can't grasp that, but it enrages me. But Carrie, we had talked about this on a few shows ago about how many kids in the Somerville public school system are actually classified as homeless. I wanna take it from that standpoint first. Uh, so I, it's funny. I, uh... It's as if you read my mind. I, would, I just asked the superintendent about that yesterday. And so at, at, currently it's about 100 students. So when we talk about reopening the buildings and not in a reckless way, but schools, it, it, it's more than education. It's more than just food. It's also for uh, many of our students, it's their home base or, uh, you know, the number of our students who are have DCF involvement right now is going up. Right. You, anytime you, you have a stressful situation and families, the economy, um, you see all of those things bubble up uh, with the kids. And so having these buildings is, is so important, but also uh, what is so essential about what the SFLC and the family liaisons do is when students and families aren't going to into the buildings. Uh, they're the connection with our families. Uh, they're also the family liaisons. Uh, uh, it's food distribution. It's, I have said it, I think on your show before, I was with one of my friends who's a, a one of the family liaisons. We were out, you know, walking distance at eight o'clock at night, she gets the call and uh, someone needed food. In the back of her van, it's like a mobile unit, right? She's got shelf stable milk, she's got cereal, she's got diapers, uh, toiletries and said, okay, Carrie, I gotta go, right? This is this is the level of commitment and hard work that this organization does. And it is, it, it's not just the services, it's just, it's that human interaction. And there's some relief in knowing that I can, call, you know, if, if I'm in need, I can call one person who I've come to know who often will speak in my my, my home language, who can then have me, uh, can help me connect with all the other agencies. It cannot be understated how important this organization is and it's, um, I'll leave it there. So, yeah. So Nomi, let me bounce the second part of the question off to you is that, you know, we are um, uh, almost two full months um, I got that right? No, a little over a month into the school virtual school year, you're getting all kinds of requests for the different types of disciplines that you can assist people with, whether it's food or housing or medical. Or Do you have any sense at all, and it's a very difficult question, do you have any sense at all on how many more homeless kids there will be in the Somerville public school system mm -hmm. as a result of the pandemic? It, it frightens me to think about it because also it's very hard to have an accurate count. We have a lot of families that are doubled up and they are actually families and buildings that we put additional energy into um, because a lot of them um, are essential workers and they need to go to work. And one of the things that I overlooked and I can't believe it because it's my personal it's, it's the work I've been doing for years prior to this, is childcare. And that's ch early childcare from infants on up and out of school time care. And it has been exposed as a crisis in a way that it never has before. And um, I just wanna make note that many of the uh, preschool childcare programs have reopened, which is absolutely extraordinary. The out of school time programs are beginning to reopen, but there is, there are many, many families in care, primarily immigrant families who are using what's called informal care, which is care they feel safe with, um, that is um, culturally um, comfortable for them, um, but it, it may not be the best situation. 
And, and Nomi, so, I, I want to follow that up with something Carrie and I talked about before in terms of how kind of middle school and high school students have been acting as surrogate caregivers absolutely, for absolutely. infants and toddlers. Yeah. And that, quite frankly, is a Herculean effort to ask these 13 and 14 and 16 year old kids to do That's while right. they are trying to master virtual learning themselves. Absolutely. And so there have been, we're, we're starting an initiative where we at least want to make inroads into that community and we may be doing some trainings. We're delivering PPE equipment. We're letting them know about the resources and maybe helping them to get licensed, but that's down the road, but it's true. And, you know, some kids don't turn on their cameras because of what's happening in their house and they may not want that exposed. So we're just, yeah, well, I think it shows, you know, with, with the issues that we've only talked about in 20 minutes, it shows the critical need for organizations like yours. So where do you go from here? I, I'm going to make some giant assumptions here is that a virtual learning may be with us in one way, shape or form through the remainder of the school year. I'm just going to make that giant leap there, knowing what we know about the progress that's being made on a uh, uh, vaccine, uh, knowing that there is no real progress in terms of a plan coming out of Washington. Uh, at this point, anyway, after November 3rd, we may have a better sense of a plan. Um, what kind of things can the average Joe do to assist Somerville Family Learning Collaborative? Help us understand what we can do to help you. Oh, that's that's lovely of you to ask. Actually, we just um, are launching a clothing drive for winter coats and boots and gloves. And we're actually looking for a place that it could be delivered to, that people could order on Amazon. But uh, we're looking for some space um, that would be available every day that could you know, receive packages. So that, that just came up today as an issue. But we're always looking for volunteers to partner up with kids or assist teachers in the virtual learning. Um, we're doing a whole um, interpreter um, translator training for folks in the community that are multilingual that want to help out with that, even though the district has um, just funded three full-time bilingual interpreter um, translators, we always need more. Um, I think understanding from the community, um, just understanding how hard a lot of these folks are working. Um, they're not paid for all the hours they work and um, that they, they really are the word Herculean really um, just says it all. It, it is huge. And Nomi, I would assume that you are um, intimately working with other organizations, other not-for-profit organizations across the city, like Welcome Project and CAST. Yeah, and yeah. actually, we, col yeah, we collaborate with the Welcome Project on our parent English classes, which are happening virtually. I mean, one of the, the positive things is we are tiptoeing into crossing this digital divide. People actually have access to computers, which was something we couldn't have dreamed of two years ago. And that may lead to other, you know, points of access for people to receive other services. Well, Nomi, I think you know that I was invited to join um, a bunch of other executive director and board people. Yeah. Um, so I'm working with Alex Peary and a bunch of other yeah. folks on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've also got an initiative going. Um, it, it's in its infant stages, but I keep lighting fires uh, under the butts of a lot of decision makers. Um, I've been in touch with Tufts University and Linda Bean from L.L. Bean and um, on to the mayor's office about opening up our uh, larger fields and spaces for wintertime wow. activities for the kids. Wow. So one of the things that we need to do is all organizations, and I'm trying to get this, actually I'm trying to get someone else to organize it and I'll be the keynote part of this, but um, to pull all the interested parties together 
so that we're not stepping on each other's toes. And if I can pull out of L.L. Bean um, two to 300 different size parkas and boots and, and uh, mittens and hats, um, that's what I intend to do. So um, it, it, now that you just said that we need a space to, for all this stuff to be delivered to, uh, I, my mind is now whirling about some of my friends, in particular, the owner of the whole Summer Nova complex down around Brooklyn Boulders and Aeronaut Brewery. And that's a lot of space down there that could be utilized. So let me just put that on the list of who well, to call. This, this, this has been a very productive conversation. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't make promises about the deliverables. I do make promises about how hard I'll work to try to make it happen. So yeah. Carrie, if you want to take it from there in terms of uh, what we should expect coming up at the town hall or anything else you want to wrap up with. Um, I think the town hall, there'll be more information about where we are in making the building safer, safe enough to, to get back in. I think you will see that it is, um, uh, we will, as a building is able to come online, we, we will do that because and it'll be staggered and it'll be flexible and it's, uh, and also the testing protocol. We, um, the mayor is having a press conference, I think tomorrow at 11 to talk about some, the, some of the partnerships around uh, testing. And so it is more information, uh, but it's, as you said, it's, it, you know, it, it'll, I wish we could just say, and here's the plan and let's do it. You know, families are exhausted, kids are worn out and teachers and educators have risen uh, to the occasion again and again and again. I can say as a parent of a high school student, the remote learning on last week, uh, you know, he opened up this kit and it was from his physics teacher and, and he did this whole experiment. And I thought, so not only did it with my kid, but more importantly, and I, I wrote Mr. Tyke a thank you letter. For the first time, all of our kids had access to the same resources at home. And to me, that's what equity is, right? It, and when I say everything, you know, uh, my son asked me for a ruler and then realized that Mr. Tyke had included, you know, little tape measures. I mean, everything was in there. And so when we talk about equity and, and, and access- And I always thought that Carrie Norman was the ruler. But uh, <laughs> Carrie, I hate to cut you off, but we are running low on time. Nomi Davidson, Somerville Family Learning Collaborative. I'll be in touch, so you stay in touch with me. Thank Carrie you. Carrie Norman, Chair of the Somerville School Committee, as always. Thank you so much. We'll probably see you all around town very soon. For the Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. As always, stay Thank safe. You, Joe. Stay see you soon. <laughs>